Chapter Seventeen: The Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Breer. Chapter Seventeen: Frugality and Economy. Economy is another old-fashioned word which, like the thing for which it stands, is fast going into disrepute, and in these days it will require no little moral courage in him who has anything of reputation at stake to commend it, and, above all, to commend it to young women. What have they to do with economy, thousands might be disposed to ask, with a subject urged upon their attention. Is there not something connected with the idea of economy which tends necessarily to narrow the mind and contract the heart? This question, too, is often asked, even by those whom age and experience should have taught better things. I am pained to find the rising generation so prone to discard both frugality and economy, and to regard them as synonymous with narrowness and meanness and stinginess. There cannot possibly be a greater mistake. May I not ask, without incurring the charge of irreverence, if there is anything more obvious in the works of the Creator than his wonderful frugality and good economy? Where in his domain is anything wasted? where indeed is not everything saved and appropriated to the best possible purpose and will any one presume to regard his operations as narrow or mean or stingy what can be more abundant for example than air and water yet is there one particle too much of either of them is there one particle more than is just necessary to render the earth what it was designed to be such a thing may be said i acknowledge by the ignorant and short-sighted and incautious. They have vent their occasional complaints even against the ruler of the skies because the windows of heaven are, for a short time, shut up, and the rain falls not. Yet these very persons are constrained to admit in their more sober moments that all is ordered about right. Be this as it may, however, there can be no doubt that a just measure of frugality and economy is a cardinal virtue and should be early inculcated, even though it cost us some time and effort. A great deal has been said, and no small number of words wasted in endeavouring to show the folly of spending two pence to save one, whereas to do so, in some circumstances, may be our highest wisdom. If it be important to learn the art of saving, the art of being frugal than the art should be acquired even if it costs something in the acquisition no one thinks of reaping the full reward of adult labour in any occupation the moment he begins to put his hand to it as a mere apprentice does he not thus in learning his occupation or trade especially during the first years spend two pence to save one does not all preparation for the future obviously involve the same necessity i do not certainly undertake to say it is always proper or indeed that it is often so to spend more in order to save less i only contend that it is sometimes so and that to do so may not only be a matter of propriety but also a duty let me give an example young women are sometimes apt to acquire a habit of being wasteful in regard to small things such as pins needles etc Yet, to teach them, in these days of refinement, always to pick up pins when they see them lying before them on the floor or elsewhere, and put them into a pin cushion or in some suitable place, would no doubt be considered as quite unreasonable. But would not such a habit be exceedingly useful? I might be told that it would be a great waste, since the value of the time consumed in thus picking up pins and needles would be more than twice the value of the articles saved. I might be told that this is not only spending two pence to save one, but that it is actually wicked? And if so, by what art shall a wasteful young woman be taught good habits? I will certainly urge a young girl who was careless about pins, needles, etc., to form the habit of picking up every one she found. I would do so to prevent her prodigal habits from extending to other matters and affecting and injuring her whole character but I would also do so to cure the bad habit already existing. More than even this, I advise every young woman who finds herself addicted to habits which are opposed to a just frugality and economy 
to begin the work of eradicating them, without waiting for the promptings of her mother and friends. Nor let her for a moment fear the imputation of meanness. It is sufficient for her that she is doing what she knows to be right. Good habits, as well as bad ones, like virtues and vices, are apt to go in company. If one is allowed, others are apt to follow. First, those that are most nearly related, next, next to those more remotely so, and finally, perhaps, the whole company. I would not dwell long on a subject like this in a book for young women, were I not assured that the case requires it. I see young women everywhere, especially among the middling and higher classes, and in great numbers too, exceedingly improvident, and not a few of them wasteful. The world seems to be regarded as a great storehouse which can never be exhausted, let them be as extravagant as they may. They forget entirely the vulgar but correct adage that, always taking out of the meal tub and never putting in, soon comes to the bottom, and seem to take it for granted there is no bottom to their resources. Our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers rather, were not ashamed of frugality or economy. They were neither afraid nor unwilling to do what they knew to be right, simply because it happened to be unfashionable. I am not indeed, if a constitutionally or by age, one of those who place the golden age exclusively in the past. I can see errors in the conduct of our grandmothers, but I also see in them excellencies, many virtues of the sterner and more sober sort, which have been bartered for modern customs, not to say vices, at a very great loss by the exchange. What we have thus lost, I should be glad, were it possible, to restore. End of chapter 17